We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Okay, uh, moving on to Rick B. There are diagrams mm-hmm. involved with Rick B. Uh, Rick has questions about two different setups in his house. Uh, starting with his living room, it's 16 and a half feet long and 20 feet wide, but it's an open concept space that's open to the kitchen, dining room, entryway, et cetera. There's also a game room behind the seating area, and uh, Rick likes to be able to still see the TV from the game room. Makes sense. So altering the layout is not really an option, not building a wall there, basically. Uh, Since Rick is spending all his money on his dedicated theater, he wants to continue using his existing equipment and only add some improvements if they'll really be worth the money. That makes sense. He's using an Atlantic Technology Passive LCR speaker bar mounted on the wall below the TV with in-ceiling surround speakers. He also has no plans to upgrade those or add any more speakers. Okay. He has a single Snell Sub-24 MK3 uh, uh, dual 12-inch driver, 550-watt, directly below the TV. I guess that's his Sub. Yes, Sub-24. And he's using a Sherborne AV receiver that is basically the Emotiva UMC1 with amps built in. As such, his receiver offers EmoQ auto setup. Yeah. So here come the questions. Rick read a very detailed review of the UMC-1 and how EmoQ handles bass equalization. Uh, According to Home Theater Shack, each speaker channel is equalized independently, then high-pass filtered with the bass getting sent to the subwoofer output. This is basically the same as independently EQing multiple subwoofers rather than summing all the bass together first and then EQing the subwoofer output in mono, which is what uh, the experts at Home Theater Shack and Odyssey and Audioholics recommend. Mm -hmm. So. Rick has not been using EmoQ, but with the room being so wide open and irregularly shaped, he's wondering if he really, really needs EQ, especially for the bass. If so, would a mini DSP be the best and most cost-effective option? Yeah, so very good question. And uh, just on the high level, I kind of want to address, it's actually interesting because the larger your room, the farther away the walls are from the sound sources, in my opinion, the less you actually need EQ. Right, yeah. because uh, the ratio of direct sound to reflected sound is going to be higher. You're going to have more direct sound reaching your ears before the reflected sound when the walls are really far away. Right, and, and by the, the time it gets to you, it will have quieted. That's a right. Bit. And when the space is really large, uh, the bass. First of all, you're not completely pressurizing this space, so we're not even worried about that. That's just a pipe dream that's out of the way. You just can't. (laughs) That's right. And you're dealing with um, less, well, can't say less bass room modes, but uh, at lower frequencies. The room modes won't be at higher frequencies. They'll be at higher frequencies in a smaller room. So when you have a lot of room modes at higher frequencies, that's when you need to worry about equalization. A lot more. You're, what, what do you mean by higher frequencies there? What frequency yeah, so like in a, in a really large room, you might have uh, standing waves at uh, 40 hertz and below or 60 right. hertz and below. But in a smaller room, you'll have standing waves at 160 hertz and below or 200 hertz and below uh, sure. because you're just talking about the walls being closer together. So walls bounce them back and forth and create a standing right. wave between those closer walls. So in this larger space, I'm actually less worried about you needing EQ than if you're in a smaller space. That's not necessarily intuitive, um, yeah. but that, you know, th- honestly, that's the case. So with this EmoQ setup now, I- I'm not a hundred percent sure on if what home theater shack described is actually the way it's still working because Emotiva has certainly issued firmware updates for things now and again. However, it does seem from the comments from their engineers that they believe this is the best way to handle uh, base equalization. So maybe they didn't change that. And if that's the case, if what they really are doing is equalizing each speaker individually, then doing the high pass filtering and sending all of that, then yeah, you're right. I don't agree with that method. And so what I would do is not do the equalization. I wouldn't even bother turning on EmoQ because it's not really worth it to do it in the speakers. Again, your ratio of direct sound to reflected sound is higher in this larger room. So I wouldn't even bother with the EmoQ. If you want to equalize the subwoofer, you can, of course, still set a crossover uh, using your receiver. Uh, And then, yeah, a mini DSP would be a great way to do this. The interesting thing is, 
you don't actually need a mini DSP. What you really need is a measurement microphone and room EQ wizard. Because if this Sherborne receiver is the same as the UMC1 Emotiva Pre-Pro, in Room EQ Wizard, uh, one of the presets for the equalizers that it can spit out based on the measurements is for the UMC1. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you can just go ahead and manually enter the values that Room EQ Wizard tells you to enter. So if Perfect. this is the same setup, you don't even need a mini DSP. All you need is a microphone and Room EQ Wizard. Tell it you have a UMC1. It will tell you what values to enter into the equalizer, and you're done. So there you yeah, go. That's the way to do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, make sure this big giant room has some sound absorption here and there. Yeah, if like it's if it's echoing, wrong. that's different, right? Yeah. But yeah. Otherwise, yeah, that like a perfect uh, approach. Let's see if he should use a mini DSP, which we're kind of saying not you necessarily. You don't really need to. Yep. Uh, will he also need to buy the UMIK, UMIK-1 microphone? The only other mic he has is the Sherborne Emotiva measurement mic that came with his AV receiver. I would suggest getting the microphone, um, yeah. the, the U-Mic one. I would suggest going to our very good friends over at Cross Spectrum Labs. Uh, they're still, uh, uh, this was like a couple months ago, uh, Herb, our good friend over there, was saying that um, uh, some of their staff w uh, unfortunately had some some things come up and they were a little bit short-staffed for the past while. So, uh, I recall that. Yes. Yeah, orders weren't getting out as quickly as they would like to. Um, they're, they're back up and running on their page. They're saying they have some stock that they are shipping out. It's, it's still kind of limited. They're not completely up and running at the pace that they were prior to all of this, but you can order things from them again sure. and they will ship them out. It might take a little bit, but if you're, if you're a little bit patient, they can. So it's really, at least worth they're honest life. about this stuff. They oh, yeah, seem yeah. honest they're and reliable. So, oh, Herb is a great on. guy. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I would advise go over to cross spectrum labs, uh, get yourself a calibrated U mic one. You don't have to buy the mini DSP. So the money you were going to put towards that. Now you can put towards an excellent microphone and then you can use room EQ wizard. That sounds like, yeah, that sounds like it's going to come out perfectly. What if he decides he wants to EQ his speakers too? Mm -hmm. Could he run EmoQ, keep its settings above 80 hertz for the speakers, manually flatten out everything below 80 hertz so that it isn't messing with the subwoofer output, then use a mini DSP just for the subwoofer? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> like, yeah. like what you're suggesting. And first of all, I, I probably would flatten everything from about 160 hertz on down. Yeah. Um, because there is the crossover, right? It's not a brick wall at 80 hertz. Exactly. It's a crossover. So I'd probably, because you can do things manually inside the uh, UMC1, or in this case, the Sherborne app that's based on it. Um, so yeah, I, I would start at about 160 hertz. I would flatten everything below that. I would activate the crossover. Then you've got your subwoofer output. Then I would run it through Room EQ Wizard. And then I would enter those values manually uh, based on what Room EQ Wizard tells you to enter. So yeah, yeah, you could. I wouldn't even advise bothering with it. Yeah, that <laughs> might be getting that. a little too deep. Uh, one more here. Should he consider one of the, is it Dirac? It units? is Dirac, yeah. Dirac, okay. Should he consider one of the Dirac units, per, perhaps the Nano AVR-DL? Would that EQ everything, including the subwoofer? So it would certainly EQ everything, including the subwoofer. Yeah. There's a couple major caveats with the nano uh, avr the nano avr has two hdmi inputs and one hdmi output which means it has to go before your av receiver in the signal chain so mm -hmm. what you're doing is source device like say an oppo blu-ray player mm -hmm. into the nano avr then the nano avr handles all of the speaker settings including equalization then it feeds 7.1 channel PCM into your AV receiver. Your AV receiver at that point should just be acting as a dumb amplifier. You don't want it touching the signal. But the uh, problem is that the nano AVR only accepts a 7.1 or 5.1 PCM signal. So the source device has to do all the audio decoding. Okay, mm. So that would work fine with an Oppo Blu-ray Blu -ray player, but it wouldn't work so great with your cable box because your cable box, if it outputs PCM, is probably limited to two-channel PCM. It probably doesn't output 5.1-channel PCM. It usually just defaults to outputting Dolby Digital 5.1. I know the Comcast box is just Dolby Digital 5.1. Yeah, Dolby Digital 5.1 or two-channel PCM. But then you right. wouldn't have any surround sound. And the Nano AVR from Mini DSP doesn't do any decoding. It can't take a Dolby Digital 5.1 signal and decode it itself. It's not a decoder. So you have right. to feed it PCM via HDMI. To me, that's not the way to go. Also, it costs $550. That's all. Yeah. And you still need a mm. microphone on top of that. 
So mm. you're talking about $650. And if you're willing to spend $650, why don't you just get a new AV receiver? <laughs> exactly. In, in particular, the Denon AVR X3300, which you can get accessories for less for $650. That has Odyssey Multi Q XT32 with Sub EQ HT. So right? it'll already do all that. Yeah, that's a very right? good deal. Yeah. <laughs> $1,000 receiver. You can get all of that built in. Yeah. So. Honestly, I don't think you're looking to spend that much money. I don't think that Nano AVR is the right solution for you in this instance. I don't begrudge anybody who wants to use the thing because it's a great little device if you want to add to rack. Uh, but yeah, the, I think with all those caveats, it doesn't make sense in this instance. Sorry, uh, now I got distracted. I'm shopping for Denon. So hang on, let me go. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, that is a good deal. It is good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> another one. Uh, he's considering adding a second subwoofer, but he has a lot of caveats. He wouldn't want to spend more than $400. He has no intention of replacing his Snell subwoofer. And the only place he'd like to put a second sub would be behind his seating. Mm -hmm. There's no convenient way to run a cable back there, so he'd need a wireless connection. But he wouldn't want to increase his $400 budget for that. Considering all that, any ideas? Uh, hmm, probably not going to be able to make that happen. Not if it's brand new. Um, right. I don't yeah, have, you could, maybe you could buy used, yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything I could suggest to you for that budget that would be brand new. You'd, you'd have to be looking used. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I look at HSU, look at, look for power sound audio, um, look for some of the older SVSs. If you can find somebody selling one used on Craigslist or audio gone or eBay or wherever it might be, uh, then that's the way I would approach this when you've got a strict $400 budget like this, or in fact, lower than that, because the wireless uh, connection thing is going to cost you at least 50 or 60 bucks. So you're probably talking more like 350 max for the sub itself. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I don't have anything that you could buy uh, brand new that I would really suggest for this because anything would kind of fall short. It would it would be a little bit of a waste because it just wouldn't live up to the needs of this room size. So right, right. That, that's so unless you got very say. lucky and found an amazing deal, yeah. that's not really going to be practical. Uh, moving on with the Rick show. Uh, lastly, <laughs> for this room, any other general suggestions? Should he add acoustic panels? I think he should always add I mean, acoustic panels, everything. Only if the room is echoey, right? Because right. if this is already carpeted, um, if you already have plush furniture, if you're not noticing, you know, clap your hands in there, all right? Yeah. Go, yeah. go to where you sit, give your hands a nice, quick, sharp clap. And if you hear reverberation from that clap, if you hear a zing in the room from that clap, then adding some more absorption literally anywhere in the room, uh, anywhere that the sound waves can go in here will be a help. Right. Uh, but if you don't, if you give a nice sharp clap and you don't hear a reverb and you don't hear a zing, you don't have to worry about it. Like I said, True. the larger room is actually easier to deal with than the small room. So, Interesting, interesting. Yeah. All right, now on to Rick's dedicated theater. Uh, and another page of information. Uh, we previously talked about the upstairs space that he's going to convert into his dedicated theater. As a reminder, he has a walled off AC utility room on one side. I do recall this. And he wanted to have a lobby area, his theater and an equipment room. He wants two rows of seating with four seats in each row. And he really likes the Fusion Collection Home Theater recliners, particularly the Escape model that offers motorized headrest. That sounds awesome. <laughs> of paramount importance to Rick is that the two middle seats in the front row both have an absolutely optimal experience. I agree with that. That has him a little bit concerned because it means he needs a wider sweet spot for both audio and video, of course, for the two sure. chairs. Uh, Rob suggested a layout that would put the equipment room directly beside the AC utility room and then have the theater next to that and then have the lobby next to the theater leading to the stairway. That layout limits the size of the theater to being 20 and a half feet long by 18 feet wide by nine feet tall, which sounds kind of nice. And he'd still want a false wall and acoustically transparent screen. Mm. So he wound up figuring 11 and a half feet from the screen to the front row, 18 feet from the screen to the back row, leaving only two feet of space from the back row to the back wall. He wants a larger theater room, especially since 11 and a half feet seems too close to the screen if both of the middle front seats are going to be absolutely optimal, maybe. So he rotated the theater 90 degrees. He put the equipment room, equipment room to the side of the theater in his plans. Now the AC utility room is directly on the other side of what will be the back wall of his theater. Uh, the back of his theater will have a sloped ceiling in these plans, but that doesn't seem like a big deal. Maybe not. Uh, this allows the theater to be 23 and a half feet long by 17 feet wide. And it allows him to move his seating to be 13 feet from the screen to the front row, 19 and a half feet from the screen to the back row, and he'd have four feet from the back row to the back wall. 
Do we see any potential problems with this layout? Rick likes it a lot better. I like it a lot too, Rick. I think that's a very clever layout. Uh, My one thought on this layout, and this is solvable, so I'm not saying this as a criticism of what you come up with. I'm just saying it's something to consider in the construction of this room, is airflow. Because uh, that equipment room, that little equipment room that's over to the side. Now, before... Uh, in in what I had suggested uh, was having this sort of equipment room that's right adjacent to the AC room, which meant it was pretty easy to move Aaron in and out of that equipment room and then have chases that would come into the theater and then make their way into the lobby. Uh, With this new plan, his equipment room that that he's sort of laid out there is kind of isolated all by itself. You need some way of getting air in and out of that equipment room because equipment is going to generate heat. It's got to be able to exhaust and draw cool air in. Then for the theater itself, again, I'm just concerned about airflow. That's that's the one thing. And this is solvable. This is something you talk with your contractor with. This is something you just say, you know, make sure they know it's a priority. You want to make sure this room can stay cool when you want it to and warm when you want it to. Exactly. Um, I think this will work very nicely because one thing that you can do here, uh, you double up that wall that's, uh, well, not double up, but like you make sure that it is a very soundproof wall in between the AC closet and the theater. And that's entirely doable, right? Whether that's putting in some staggered studs or even a double stud wall. And And then probably a heavier door that's, you know, that's right. You know, a couple layers of drywall with some green glue in between. You can make that a very soundproof wall. Then you can have uh, cold air that comes right in through that back wall. And you can have the vent for the hot air up towards the front of the room. And you're actually going to have some space. I'm actually even noticing there's this little unused space right next to the stairway. You can actually yeah, yeah. use that to construct yourself a little dead vent, a dead vent with a little fan in there, a little exhaust fan that will draw the warm air out of the room, exhausted into this lobby area. Uh, and I'm less concerned about that. So oh. I, th- I think this is totally solvable. I, just... I like that airflow idea, by the way, yeah, pulling yeah. it into that little nook that's not being used for much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just just blowing it into your lobby there. T- turn that turn that into your dead vent because then it's on the outside of your theater. And I don't think right. I'm too worried about a little exhaust fan noise in the lobby area there. So uh, yeah. to me, totally solvable is just that's the one thing I would point out in this plan as being the concern. Uh, let's not overlook it, but it's totally solvable. So, yeah. So the the only thing that seems strange to me, you're just entering the theater near the front right speaker. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, because uh, that's oh, all going to be a false wall up there. Uh, but he's going for a large screen size, acoustically transparent, and there's just enough room to have a uh, door up there. I I think this looks great. No, I like it. I like it. I like that bigger size, yeah, and you yeah. can you can fix those few little problems. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just Go a thing it. to be aware of. That's all. Good. Yeah, that's so he did a good job looking at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, we're still going with Rick here. With a 13-foot viewing distance and his desire for a greater than 45-degree field of view, he'd be looking at a screen that's 135 inches wide. That'd be a 155-inch diagonal 16 by 9 screen or a 147 inch diagonal 2.35 to one screen Mm -hmm. with such a large screen size. He'd need upwards of 1400 lumens coming out of his projector just to hit 15 to 16 foot Lambert's (laughs) let alone the 30 foot Lambert we've been recommending for HDR. So, Is there some ideal compromise he could aim for in terms of screen size and viewing distance and light output? I think so. I think there is. Um, Because we're going to get into this next. He's talking about what projectors to choose or or a little bit later on coming up. Um, But you can definitely get projectors that can consistently output around 1,000 lumens. That Mm -hmm. That is certainly doable. And I'm talking about with expanded color um you know very accurate color for uh hdtv and then expanded color uh when you're watching ultra hdtv content um now to me about the ideal screen size for today's projectors that aren't uber expensive uh, is about 135 inches diagonal if you're talking 16 by 9 that's 120 inches in width all right Uh, To me, a 120-inch width screen works perfectly because then if you want to hit the 15-foot Lamberts for standard dynamic range, you need 800 lumens. You double that to get the 30-foot Lamberts uh, for Mm. HDR. And that's all doable. That's actually all doable. Yeah, that's all in the range of what you can get without breaking the bank. Yeah, so that, you know, but... To get 45 degree field of view with a screen that is 120 inches wide, you'd have to sit 12 feet away. Yeah, he's a little uh, farther. Yeah. Now that's that's okay. Um, certainly, if this was a like you only cared about the one central seat, 
I'd have zero problem with that. That's kind of probably what I would choose for myself. Sit 12 yeah. feet away from 120 inch width screen, get myself a 45 degree field of view, uh, get a modern projector that can easily put out 800 foot, uh, 800 lumens and then double that to 1600 when I want to watch HDR. Um, but since you got these two seats that are next to each other, first of all, I'll mention with those escape seats, I, I like those. I didn't know about those previously. So those, those are nice looking seats. I like those a yeah. lot. And they do have the option I was looking for, which is you could make the two seats that are in the middle a love seat so they don't have, uh, you know, a, a permanent arm in between them. Nice. But they offer a, um, what would you call it? Like a, a temporary arm. It's basically an arm with a little wedge that wedges itself in between the two seats of the love seat. So, because oh. he said a lot of times he's going to be actually watching this with his, uh, with his brother and maybe they don't want to be touching thighs together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can put this little temporary yeah. arm in the wedge of the love seat, that is that is absolutely an option with these escape seats. That gets you a little bit closer together, just a little bit closer together, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. if you want to do that, that's one option. Now, I think what you should do is go for a screen that is 130 inches in width, all right? If that ends up being a 16 by 9 screen, that's going to be a 150 inch screen which is absolutely a standard screen size. Right, thing. so that's right at what he was talking about, 155-inch diagonal 16 by 9 screen. So, so you're saying 150-inch. So 150 150-inch. I'm talking, you know, 5 inches yeah. less diagonal, but 130 inches wide. Then if you're 12 and a half feet, yes. all right, instead right, of 13, right. 12 and a half, you uh, still get your 45-degree field of view, or actually a little bit more. You get right, a 47-degree right. field of view if you're 12 and a half feet. 150 inches, you need 1,000 lumens. There are projectors that can do that. To me, that's the compromise for everything you right, want right. to do. All right? So we're not talking about going way smaller than what he had thought. We're talking right. about sitting six inches closer, which I don't think right. is the end of the world. Um, to me, that works out well. So I'm saying go for a 150-inch so, 16 by 9 screen. Yeah. Okay. So literally you're saying just move his seat six inches closer, six inches. go for a five inch smaller diagonal measurement yeah. on a 16 by nine screen. And just by that little bit, he lands in that sweet spot yeah. uh, of projectors that can hit the brightness he wants That's right. at that size. Yeah. That sounds perfect. Yeah. And he's got the room to move things around this. Yeah. This is looking good. I think so. You know, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I think so too. That, mm -hmm. that sounds like the, an easy compromise. It'll hardly feel any different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, a couple more things. He wants an acoustically transparent screen, and he's eyeing the Screen Acoustics Ultra Weave V6 that is featured on AVS Forum. Uh, but they spec it as having a 0.82 gain, mm. which would mean he needs even more light output. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Seymour AV Center Sage XD material is spec at 1.2 gain, but measured at 0.94. Mm -hmm. Now, so Rick is extremely concerned about the visibility of the weave, as he says he is very prone to be able to see any sort of texture or sparklies. I get irritated at that, too. <laughs> uh, so would the higher gain Seymour AV material be okay? Yes. <laughs> in that very yeah. same report where they measured it and they got they got slightly under 1.0 gain for, for all intents and purposes, it's a 1.0 gain screen. Right, right. Uh, it really is. They said if you're anywhere from 11 feet or farther back, you're not going to see that weave. You're not going to see you're the texture. And back, you're 12 feet back. And you moved you six inches closer, <laughs> you're but you're still a, a foot away from visibility of the weave. Yeah. Unless so. you are a falcon and you can see <laughs> things three miles away, <laughs> you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I think that's the way to go. I think that makes all the sense in the world. I, I do believe it's a little bit more expensive than that mm -hmm. uh, Screen ex Acoustics Ultra Weave, but he was planning on getting a Seymour AV frame regardless yes. and then doing his own frame screen material i'm like in this case pay the little bit extra for that uh, center stage xd i think it's totally worth it and Again, i'm not worried about you at all we're seeing the weave this all sounds like it's 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 pulling together to a focus yeah. point here and i think that seymour and, is a perfect uh, match 130 inches wide is one of seymour's uh, standard screen sizes so no worries there look at that uh see it's all coming together <laughs> uh one more question would the jvc dla-rs500 same as the X750 be a good choice? Or is there a different projector he should consider? So first of all, yes, it would be a very good choice. Very good uh, it's projector. one of the projectors that can actually, uh, when it's calibrated for uh, Rec. 709 color, can output 1,500 lumens. Uh, so you're you're hitting that HDR there spec you uh, if you're not expanding the color uh, too much. Uh, and then with the expanded color with its digital, digital cinema filter in place, uh, it can still hit like 11, 1,200 lumens. 
Uh, hmm. So it's it's definitely capable of handling this 150 inch screen size that we're talking about. So right. on that front, it's a good choice. I will say there is another projector you might want to consider. Yes, and I see you've provided me a link to an that's Epson. That's right. <laughs> the, the reason you might want to consider this, uh, and it's going to be the Epson Pro Cinema LS 10500, and that is their laser driven projector. Lasers. So first of all, it has lasers. So that kind of makes it win. Just <laughs> that's just awesome. It has lasers. Uh, but more than that. <laughs> Uh, what it has is that wider color gamut. So in terms of maximum lumen output, it can't quite match the JVC, but what it can do is maintain higher brightness with the wider color gamut. Okay. So this is a little bit, what do you value more? Do you value peak light output most of all, in which case I'll say go for that JVC you're looking at, mm -hmm. or do you value the wider color a little bit mm. more than the peak light output because with the lasers uh, driving the light engine, it can maintain that wider light output right up to a thousand lumens and above. I'd be leaning toward the lasers and not just because it's lasers and that sounds <laughs> awesome and all your friends come over and you go, look at my laser projector. I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can control the light in this room and if you get the, you know, because an intense color outside your normal color gamut that you're not used to seeing, an intense bright color just looks so popping and in, so realistic in projection my opinion is that the wider color matters more because even when you're talking hdr and hitting 30 foot lamets we're only talking about doubling the light output which is very very visible to our eye on a huge mm -hmm. image like that but the wider color makes a huge impact too i right. kind of lean towards that also the laser light engine is going to last longer and it's not going to dim at nearly as much over time those jvcs I and know. those those initial light measurements you have to remember that's when the bulb is brand new and they're going to get dimmer and dimmer as the thing ages of course you can replace the bulb but there's a cost to that with the lasers they last longer they don't dim nearly as much over time um, so what's the price difference here between these two projectors uh so that ls10500 is 8000 the x750 is 7500 so oh, yeah i i at 500 dollars for me because I, I learned a long time ago that like like in the it's, a, it's analogous it's not the same thing but it's analogous like the, the the fact that resolution isn't everything that a 720p picture with with perfect contrast and right. and, and colors tweaked out just right looks way better than a poorly done uh 1080 signal so it, it, you know just you can't focus too much on every on on one aspect of image quality i'd go for just controlling the light a little better and getting these crazy good colors. Yeah. To me, anyway. But if you go with okay. the JVC, you won't be disappointed. So don't think no, I'm it's not bad. it at all. Yeah. This is all, it's a little theoretical to you sit and look That's at right. it. That's right. I've not had the pleasure. I would like that. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, a couple more things. He's uh, planned for two pairs of side surround speakers. Could he also use two pairs of top rear speakers so that each row of seats would get their own pair of speakers overhead? So we actually had a very similar question last week. And in fact, uh, uh, he, he updated, he wrote it and again. He's like, oh, you don't even really have to answer this question because I kind of heard the answer last week. And and we'll stick to that same advice. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, in my opinion, to uh, double up on the overhead speakers because we just don't phantom image above us the way we phantom image in front of us and beside us. Besides, so it's, yeah. it's not exactly the same effect. However... Uh, there's no harm in pre-wiring uh, for more overhead positions because just adding some sure. speaker wire up there doesn't increase your cost very much. Doesn't mean you have to connect it to anything, but running right, the right. wire makes all the sense in the world. And uh, Rick also said, you know, maybe he'll give that three receiver uh, solution a try. That's not out of the realm of possibility <laughs> uh, where you're feeding okay. your top front and top rear signals into a Dolby Pro Logic receiver, which then generates a top middle uh, signal wow. by using Dolby Pro Logic. Of course, you need a Dolby Pro Logic receiver for the right hand side of the room and a second one for the left hand side of the room, oh, meaning cool. you end up with three receivers. But considering you want to do all that pre wire for it, don't yes. go insane and think that you have to use it right away, but you might as well have the wires in the ceiling. Yes, yeah, so always over wire. Sure. If you've got the opportunity when you're building, always throw some extra wires anywhere you think something might be needed. That's, yeah. I give that advice to, uh, to everybody. Uh, so should he pre-wire for any other speaker locations? Voice of God, front <laughs> wides. Uh, yes. Why not? Maybe. I mean, honestly, uh, I don't know where you're going to get front wides anymore. 
Because uh, either in the door, <laughs> even Den well, even Denon and Marantz have dropped front wide speaker support from their right, right. from their newest models. So I don't know if that's entirely again speaker wire is pretty darn cheap. So what's really the harm? But uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd go for front wides these days because I don't know what's going to generate them for you. I'd mostly I, I have no problem with having those six overhead speakers. Maybe uh, go ahead and pre wire for front heights. Uh, because you might decide that you prefer to have speakers that are right above the screen as opposed to in the ceiling above your seats. That that could be a preference thing. Why sure. not run the speaker wire there? What is it? So hurt? again, you know, spending another hundred bucks on speaker wire to put them in all these places is is not very if it's, harmful. Yeah, if it's even that. So yeah, maybe that. Uh, sure, go ahead and wire for a Voice of God speaker. Maybe Oro 3D will come and take over the world. There's going to be 10 whole Sony titles with Oro 3D. So oh. uh but yeah, why not? <laughs> All right, Rick, that was your show. Woo! <laughs> Excellent stuff, though. A lot of a lot of good concepts in there. Talking about when you're when you're planning a home. Meeting. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.